plants, and this is kind of going to be focused on Missouri because that's kind of where I live, although I haven't lived my whole life here. I've lived in a few other Midwestern states, so this kind of applies to a lot of the Eastern United States. So it should work pretty well, pretty much for anywhere around there. And, you know, globally, there are some things that will still apply pretty much to anybody that's anywhere. So it's definitely a thing. Um, but anyway, I'll go ahead and get started. So this is uh, Native Plants, How You Can Improve Ecosystem Function. Now I can say from the start, um, a lot of what I'm going to say, I'm kind of indebted to um, Dr. Doug Tallamy. If you have never seen any of his talks on this subject, they are just absolutely fantastic. I'm going to kind of skim the surface of some of what he's talked about, um, but certainly there are lots of other native plant talks out there, but I'm going to, like I said, do the kind of Missouri version. So first thing, let's talk about what are native plants. This gets, this term gets moved around quite a bit, and probably the most common definition you'll run into is, you know, plants but that were in an area before a particular period of time. Usually they're talking about sort of when Europeans showed up. But if we just say that, and we don't have any kind of bottom boundary to that, we could say, well, what about the plants that were here when the dinosaurs were here? It's like, that would be something like a ginkgo. We have fossils of ginkgo in this kind of general, at least continent during that time. Does that mean they're native? And uh, I mean, I guess some people will be sort of like, yes, it's like it means before that time, it means that forever. And I would say, you know, the definition that Telemi has used and that I really agree with is that really when you're looking for plants that have been interacting with the organisms around them for millions or at least thousands of years. So that they have relationships with the other organisms that are in the area. So if you bring in a ginkgo, for example, sure, maybe it was here millions of years ago, but most of those relationships have been severed. And so the ginkgo essentially would act like a quote, non-native plant because those relationships simply aren't there. So what you're interested in as far as your native plants is, you know, that it has pollinators, that there are herbivores, you know, there are things that are interacting with it. So what we can we think about when we think about um, native plants, we can talk about a native range. So a lot of people get really hung up on these, these range maps. Now, notice that these range maps, of course, were made once Europeans started showing up and once Europeans were kind of recording things. And, you know, we didn't even really have good maps until, you know, relatively recently, especially to get really good maps. Um, you know, now we're actually able to use satellite data. So as much as we might want to say, wow, this is a really good range map, you know, we don't really know exactly where some of these plants were hundreds of years ago, much less thousands of years ago. You're using things like pollen and that sort of thing. But what native range usually means now is kind of like, this is where it's been found relatively recently, within the past 100-ish years or so, maybe 200 if you're, if you're doing well. So what I'm showing here is we've got um, the pecan on the left, and you can see it's got a really wide native range. It goes all the way down into Mexico, it's parts of Texas, all the way up into basically parts of Iowa, at least as following the Mississippi River Valley. You say, wow, that's crazy. So does that mean I can take a pecan tree from Texas and put it in Missouri and it'll be fine? You might guess the answer is not really. Those are very different climates. So even though you say, oh, well, it's a native plant, yes, but it also matters kind of the region from which it comes. Now, if I took something from Southern Indiana and planted it in Missouri, it might be okay because that's much more similar in latitude. And also, of course, notice there are those gray spots in Northern and kind of Southern Missouri where there aren't any natural pecans growing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they couldn't grow there or it would be somehow bad to grow them there. Now we can compare that to something like the blue spruce on the right that one, you notice, Missouri's not even on this part of the map. That's way over to the right. So we plant, we as in human beings, plant 
blue spruce in the eastern United States all the time. But it is, even though it's native to North America, it is way, way far away from any, where any, you know, herbivores or, well, I guess you wouldn't really have pollinators because it's a conifer, so they're wind pollinated. But any of the things that would normally interact with that plant would be present. You've just, you've moved it completely out of there. Now, maybe if we went back tens of thousands, maybe millions of years, maybe the blue spruce or the ancestors of blue spruce were growing in this area. But that's not really very relevant to what we're thinking about today as far as native plants. So it's just something to think about. Okay, so what are invasive species? So you could say this is kind of the opposite of a native species, but not necessarily. Not everything that is not native is invasive. So what is an invasive species? It's something that's actually going to invade. It's going to disrupt. It's going to start taking over environments. There are plenty of non-native species out there that do not do this. They're fine and they don't cause problems. You know, something like most um, rose bushes. Now, Multiflora rose is an example of a species that is actually invasive, but most of our cultivated roses they're not really going to cause problems. They don't spread. There's plenty of things that eat them, that attack them, that they're, they're basically not going to be out of control. Really what makes a species invasive is that it has, it has lost or doesn't have relationships with species that would control it. So there's no predators for it. There's no diseases, you know, no fungus, no bacteria, no viruses that really bother them. Like nothing will eat them and maybe they have a really great um, interaction with the environment. It's like it's very good for them and so they just take over and then they can push out the native species that do have interactions with all of these other organisms and then those organisms can be in trouble. Uh, invasive th species are thought to be kind of the second most common cause of um, extinction and, and uh, loss of species. The first being, of course, habitat loss. If there's nowhere for an organism to live or grow, then that's kind of a big problem. But the second one is this. You can have a habitat, you can be full of green stuff, but nothing's living on it. So it's essentially, it's almost not quite as bad as a plastic plant because they would still provide um, photosyn photosynthesis, I mean oxygen, and of course it would absorb carbon, but it wouldn't support any other species. So this is why invasive species are bad. So the picture I have, now technically what I, what this particular beetle, this is called a Japanese beetle, at least around here it is, it comes from Asia, and they are a generalist beetle and they just love to eat all kinds of things. Many times they are actually eating non-native species themselves. So that is actually on a cherry tree. Now that cherry tree in Missouri, it's a sweet cherry, it's not native, it is not remotely invasive. So it's not something that's going to cause problems. It's something I could eat, but it's not going to take over any ecosystems. Now the Japanese beetle, it's pretty damaging to our cultivated crop, crops, and it is damaging to certain uh, native species, especially things like basswood. It's very, very hard on basswood, but many of our native species it ignores. So it is an example of an invasive species that causes problems, but not every non-native species is invasive, and that's important to remember. So why do natives matter? Why are we even talking about this? Why can't we just grow any kind of green stuff that we like? It's like, I like that. Why shouldn't I be able to grow it? And of course, it's a free country. You can grow it in most cases. There are situations where certain species are at least prohibited from being sold. Uh, it would be probably nice if we had more regulations like that but in general you know people will also share seeds with each other which is good in most cases uh, but some of the invasive species can be pretty bad so one of the big things you see in these pictures and I grabbed these off of the internet so these are pictures of just lawns and if some many of us we have this kind of idea of you know things should be neat and manicured and if you've ever been in nature, like this is not something that you see in nature very much. It's very unusual. And we sort of, I don't know how our society has decided that this is a good thing, but you know, this takes a lot of effort, especially to make things perfectly like no weeds, nothing. 
that takes chemicals. And of course, those chemicals are going to kill some of the native species that might be in the area, even if they're not actually in the lawn. It's also something that requires a lot of fertilizer, usually to make things green. It's gonna require water to keep it green, especially somewhere here in Missouri where our summers can be kind of dry. Gee, well, we gotta make sure the grass looks green, so we better make sure that we water it. And it's sort of like in a world where there's so many places with little water, it's like, is this what we really should be doing? So we spend a lot of effort and a lot of time to make things quote unquote look nice and you know, it's, it's, I, I maintain it's a little questionable. So the other thing we can see in this picture on the left side, you can see those trees with flowers on them. That's a fairly famous invasive species around here called calorie pear. Now, of course, by saying pear, you might think of those nice tasty things that you get in the grocery store. Those are typically European or Asian pears. And those are really large sized fruits. And a lot of times people don't wanna plant those in their yard because they're sort of like, well, it makes a mess, it drops. And then bees might wanna come and eat it. It's like, or you could come and eat them. So instead we plant this other species that has these teeny tiny little pears. And because these teeny tiny little pears are small enough that birds can eat them, they can pick them up and take them places. They say, well, then isn't it providing ecosystem function? It's feeding the birds, right? Well, yes. But unfortunately, the reason this tree is such a problem is there are no insects that really can eat this tree to speak of. It makes cultivated pears really nice things to grow because not much does eat them. But when you have a teeny tiny little pear that is useless as far as human food and then the birds spread it, that's bad. Because if there aren't any insects eating that tree, all those birds that ate the fruit, when they go to raise their offspring, there's no insects for them to feed their offspring because they need, they need insects to be able to, be able to basically raise their young. So essentially, you know, well, you're feeding them as adults, but you're starving them when they're babies. And it's sort of like, that's gonna really cause a problem as far as bird populations. And of course, insects are gonna feed lots of other, other species as well. So this is one of the big issues. So people say, oh, it doesn't matter. I planted these in the, my yard, they don't spread. This is, of course, going to be the issue, is the birds are going to spread them around whether you notice it or not. So anyway, moving along, other reasons why they matter. So there are also lots of insects which are valuable in their own right, and they are what we call host plant specific. This is the reason why nothing eats the calorie pear, is insects will eat usually a specific or group species or group of species of plants. So for example, on the left, these are these three are actually all pictures I personally took. Uh, that is a beetle called a dogbane beetle. And of course you might guess it's eating a plant called dogbane. And dogbane's a little bit weedy, um, but it is a native plant and it does support this beetle. And it's also kind of useful for fiber if you're interested in that. I use it to make rope sometimes. Uh, the middle species is a zebra swallowtail, and its only host is something called pawpaw. And if you see zebra swallowtails, you know that there must be pawpaws around because basically they cannot, they cannot live, they cannot grow without that. Now the one on the right, that's a caterpillar. And I looked up what species it is, I don't remember what it was right now, but it's, it's a little bit more of a generalist. It's actually eating my apple tree. Now, of course, a lot of us would say, oh, it's eating my apple tree. I need to get the pesticides out and kill it. But I recognize that if I do that, then it's gonna kill pretty much all the different kinds of insects, whether they are beneficial and they might eat some of these caterpillars or not, and they could potentially, depending on what you spray, poison birds. So. I don't really want to spray my trees, so I let the birds come in and eat my caterpillars instead. And usually that works pretty well. So as I mentioned, the other thing that's happening in the world is pollinators. So things like bees. Now, honeybees are pro kind of the less problem, but especially things like bumblebees and many other native bees, they are declining. Birds are declining. It's like, why are they doing that? Probably at least some of it is because we're planting all these non-native species, some of which are invasive, some of which are not, but basically they're not providing food for any of these other species. They're just there for us to look at them. And I think it's probably better for us to share the earth with other organisms. So 
this is what's going to provide food for birds and other species. So native plants do that. So that's a valuable thing. And you say to yourself, okay, okay I'm going to share the world with them. I don't like that. That doesn't sound very nice. But of course, human beings are, of course, supported by the ecosystem. If the ecosystem doesn't function, it may not be supporting us very well. But even if that doesn't convince you, you can, of course, use some of these. Some of these things are directly useful to people. So some native plants also provide food for humans. So there's lots of tasty edible plants that you can grow that are also native. Um, persimmon is one of my favorite ones. American persimmon pretty much grows all over the Eastern United States. Uh, there are Asian species of persimmons, um, but they are not very winter hardy. So at least where we are in Missouri, it doesn't really work very well. Um, pecans or pecans, depending on who you talk to, how you pronounce it, they are a native crop. So I showed you the range map, but really anywhere kind of in the eastern U.S., this is a very tasty, valuable crop. And of course, it's going to provide habitat for all these different species, assuming that you're not spraying them with insecticides or other pesticides. Uh, pawpaws, I already mentioned, pawpaws are kind of becoming popular, although I would caution people that they do um, have a toxin in their fruit called ananasin. If you want to do more research on that, I will probably put a link in my description about that. Uh, elderberries have also become very, very popular. There is a, a European species, but there's also a native species that grows here, Sambucus canadensis. Uh, blackberries are another one. Dewberries, that's actually what my picture is right there. Those are the wild dewberries that just came up in my garden. So on the right, those are my goats um, trying to eat the wild plums, which is not the best for them. It's not bad when they eat them when they're green, but um, any of the pretty much members of the genus Prunus, if they're wilted, they can actually produce cyanide. So you have to be careful if you have domestic animals uh, with these things around. But wild plums are really nice. Um, they don't have a lot of flesh on them. There are some cultivars, which I'll talk about in a second, that you can get from these. Um, black walnuts, they're actually incredibly healthy. They're really, really good for you. And at least in our area, they're just, they're dropping all over the place and you can pick them up and process them. It is kind of a pain, but you can also buy them pretty easily. Um, butternut is kind of a special species that I like. It's kind of endangered because of an invasive fungus, uh, but it also produces edible nuts. So you can, if you can find butternuts and anywhere you have, you can also use them to eat, not just to preserve them. Uh, service berries, another one, currants. And this is not remotely an exhaustive list. There's just tons and tons of different species that human beings can just directly eat. And I've already mentioned the um, dog bane that you can use as fiber. So lots of different uses for plants. This is what people have done for thousands of years. And of course, as long as you're not going out collecting all of them from a wild area, uh, this is pretty good. But you can grow them in your yard and have a little bit of food. So other things, what it, what's in it for you? So native grasslands, I've talked a little bit about trees and shrubs and things. These can also be really good forage for livestock. This is actually a picture of my property during this year. Uh, we had a pretty severe drought going on and I was looking at kind of all the neighbor's fields that were mostly non-native fescue and the grass was just like brown and dead and we were just green. Now we just have a few um, Nigerian dwarf goats so they don't eat a whole lot but our pasture was still green pretty much the whole time we finally got some rain towards the end of the season and it did kind of regenerate some of those other fields thankfully uh, but ours really never had a problem uh, and tall grass prairie is very very drought tolerant and um, the Missouri Department of Conservation has been promoting this particular kind of grassland because um, because of its drought tolerance and it's pretty good livestock forage. So you can use it, you can use it for hay. You can basically hay it at least once a year. Um, I've got some of the species on there. I've got big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass. Those are all grasses, as you might guess. Uh, prairie drop seed is another one, but there's also forbs in there. You can kind of see some of those little yellow flowers. And those provide, especially for my goats, kind of a little bit of diversity in their fare. And that's really what they need. 
So I kind of mentioned cultivars a little bit earlier. One of the things that we get into when you're dealing with plants that are useful to human beings is you'll run into cultivars. And there's a lot of debate in the native plant community. It's like, well, are cultivars really okay? I don't know. There's kind of some argument. And especially when we're dealing with human food, basically human beings are like, okay, I want to get more food out of these things. So on the left, I've got what's a northern pecan. Now, of course, if you get pecans at the store, you're probably getting stuff that was grown much farther south. So I mentioned that the range goes all the way down into Texas. And because their seasons are longer, they can grow pecans that are larger than the ones that we can grow in the north. But the ones that we grow in the north, some people, and I'm one of them, kind of prefer the taste because it's kind of a lighter flavor. So the pecans are typically lighter. And that actually has to do with the oil quality. They actually have somewhat better oil quality. So that variety right there, Liberty, is actually one I just planted last year. Uh, in the middle, that's a pawpaw called Overlease. And it's been bred to basically produce more flesh and less seeds because pawpaws can have just an absolutely insane number of giant hard seeds inside of them. Uh, the one on the right, that one is called Dollywood, so that's another American persimmon. And they typically have a lot of seeds, but you can get um, some that don't produce seeds. So native plants can have these cultivars. So you say, well, does that matter? And that's a question. So do they count? Is do I, if I plant a cultivar, does that count? And I, it's one of those things, it depends. So it depends on what that cultivar has really been, why has it been named, why has it been selected? The main reason, again, going back to the, what I talked about as far as native plants, it's all about what role do they fulfill? Will that allow them to fulfill the same role? So if your cultivar just has bigger fruit, it's probably not going to make a whole lot of difference. You know, as long as it doesn't have like an extreme resistance to insects or something like that, as long as it can support those same organisms that would normally eat it, I don't, I personally would say it probably isn't going to matter. Now, if you start selecting based on color, so that's what I've got a picture of on the left, that's called, that's a nine bark, Physocarpus opulus folius, and that is an unusual color, especially the color of leaves. And of course it looks pretty to us, but if you're an insect trying to find somewhere to lay your eggs, you're gonna look at that and go like, what the heck is that? So many times those kind of weird colors will confuse insects and then that plant is not fulfilling the same role that it ordinarily would. So on the right, I've got some echinacea hybrids. You can get these at you know, pretty much any big box store you can shake a stick at. And you say, well, is that still useful? It's like, well, maybe it's just the flower, but of course, could those flower colors confuse pollinators? Maybe they're lacking, especially those ultraviolet signals that bees need to be able to find the flowers. You know, they look great to us. Do they look great to a bee? I don't know. Because the point of flowers originally was to look great to bees, not necessarily to us. So we have to be careful you know, what kinds of cultivars we're getting. The safest thing is to actually get something that is from your area. You know it's going to be interacting with the things that are in the area. That makes the most sense. But, you know, sometimes that's not always what works in your yard. So sometimes we have to make compromises. So we can also talk about hybrids. And I've kind of mentioned a few situations where you'll have a related species that's from another continent somewhere Sometimes it's from within the same continent. We hybridize different species to make something better. So on the right, these are some echinacea that have been hybridized. They're, they're mutants. They, and pretty much all of our uh, cultivated cultivars really are, probably have some kind of mutations, but these are really affecting the shape of the flower. If you are a bee and you're trying to get pollen from something like that, probably not a lot of those are going to work and they're going to be kind of like it's almost like a little trap where you know no organism is really going to be able to make use of this um, I, my mother actually was growing and these were not native um, impatience a few years ago and they were double they had extra petals in them 
And I remember being there and seeing this poor hummingbird trying to figure out where it could get nectar from these things. And of course, it was basically kind of wasting energy trying to use these flowers that had been so modified by people that they were useless to the hummingbirds. And of course, that's just an obvious hummingbird. Bees, of course, are going to be confused as well. So when you've got these super modified flowers, even though we humans are like, wow, these are super cool, you know, we could in unintentionally be doing just little tiny bits of damage to the environment, to our ecosystem by not supporting the pollinators. Now, does that mean that hybrids are always bad? I would say no, because there are some situations where a hybrid is basically kind of the only way to preserve a species. And I've got an example over there, the hybrid butternut. So butternuts, as I mentioned, are being attacked by a non-native fungus. Well, it turns out there is a relatively closely related species actually from Asia. Uh, butternut will not hybridize with any of the other native species of walnuts that are here, but it will hybridize with this Asian species. And the Asian species does have resistance. So it's kind of like, well, we could hope that uh, the butternut just magically on its own develops resistance to this, or we can cultivate at least some of these hybrids to preserve at least some part of the species so that some of the species that depend on it will stick around, hopefully. So hybrids in some cases can be useful in that situation. And of course, in a you know growing situation, you might want to use a hybrid. But again, if you're trying to support ecosystem function, it's probably not your best bet, but sometimes it's your only option. Okay, so what do native gardens look like? Now this comes from another company. This is uh, Monarch Gardens LLC. I don't have any relationship with them. I just went to their website. I'm gonna put a link to their website. I just have followed them on social media and said, wow, these guys are, are really cool. They have kind of a good uh, model of how we can actually kind of bring nature into our own yards. So they're actually based in Nebraska. They're using a lot of high density planting and these are mostly a lot of these prairie plants. Now what they often do is, and we've done this on our properties, they'll do um, kind of mowed strips, kind of through the middle and around the edges. So it doesn't kind of, it kind of gives people signals of like, oh yes, someone's actually taking care of this. Of course, they do actually require maintenance to take care of these and you have to kind of know your plants a little bit because, you know, there can get weeds in here and if you don't recognize them, especially weed trees, they could actually cause you problems because you're not mowing them as much. But in terms of supporting native native organisms and native species, this is some of the best thing that you could do. If you're saying, hey, I wanna do, I wanna go all out, I wanna do everything, something like this is probably, this is your best bet, is something along these lines. But they don't have to be kind of quote unquote wild looking, you can use them in a formal setting. Again, I grabbed these off of the internet just to show you that native plants are not inherently messy, they are just they are plants. Plants are plants. You can use them how you want. Now, some of them will be taller, and a lot of times you'll get these cultivars that people have bred to be shorter. Again, that's, you know, if you're kind of stuck in a situation where you need to have something that looks very neat and tidy, or you just desperately need that for yourself, get a cultivar. If that's, if that's what it takes, it's better to do that than have something that is, you know, not native and not going to support ecosystem function at all. Okay, so what can you do? So you say, okay, I'm convinced, or at least maybe I'm thinking about it. First of all, if you own property, grow native plants, like any kind of native plants, and this would apply no matter where you are. So worldwide, we have this problem. There's invasive species going all over the world. Find out what is native to your region and grow it. Just grow it. If you're in a warm region, you can grow things in pots like pretty much all year. If you're in a cold region, that becomes a lot more difficult, but it's better to grow something in a pot even just for a year than, you know, to not contribute at all. The other thing you can do is you can volunteer at a park. You can um, get different plots of land. If you have relatives that have land or property of any kind, you know, Ask them, 
you know, can I plant this? A lot of times if you come to a place, you come to a park, you say, hey, I've propagated this tree, can I plant it? Many times they'll say, yeah, sure, you want to plant it yourself, you can plant it. That's one of the things you can do. You can donate them to, to schools, you can donate them to parks. The most important thing is don't spray pesticides because of course, if we're talking about insects being the base of the ecosystem, if you have native plants and you're like, oh, a bug's eating it, I need to go spray it, then that's really bad. So don't, do not spray pesticides. That's kind of the antithesis of what we're talking about. You say, okay, well, I can't, I'm in this HOA, they scare me, I can't, I can't do all that stuff. I can only do a little bit. So what can I focus on? So what I would say, and I'm a little bit biased because I really love trees, is plant a native tree because I have over my years as a kid I was always into trees one of the things I've noticed is like I will go back on Google Maps and I'll look at my old properties where I used to live and the trees that I planted people generally don't cut them down even if you move they may rip your garden out they may rip your shrubs out but they generally won't cut your trees out so if you're, especially if you're a young person and you're potentially gonna move between different houses, everywhere you go, you know, leave a native tree behind because odds are nobody's gonna cut it down. That's pretty much how it works. So what I've got over here, this is on the left, you've got the Smithsonian Migratory Bird um, kind of list of how many species of caterpillars, Lepidopterans, caterpillars basically turn into butterflies and moths, those are Lepidopterans, how many species are on a particular genus of plants? So number one up there are oaks. So wherever you are, there is likely to be a native oak. So find out what those species are and propagate them. They're pretty easy. Most people know what acorns are. Uh, many times it re it's required for you to basically either plant it outside or you can put it in the fridge, but it then won't grow and you can start a tree and basically plant it somewhere. You can also use any of the members of the genus Prunus. So plums, cherries, so like I said, those native plums, they're super easy to take care of and then they make fruit. You know, the fruit's not always super great when it's fresh, but it makes wonderful jelly and preserves. Um, willows are super fast growing. Birches are very, um, very ornamental. Uh, Populus, any of the poplars, they tend to be fast growing. Apples, it's like if you like apple trees, if you don't wanna do a full on, hey, I'm gonna have an apple tree, get a crab apple. Crab apples are super great. Maples are pretty good. So lot going on down the list, any of these things, they're really gonna provide a lot of resources for, especially for birds, but for all different kinds of insects. The other thing to remember is you don't have to have every less plant in your landscape be native. You don't have to go, oh, well, it's not native, I can't have it. The main thing is you're kind of looking at what's the percentage of your landscape. And this is one of the reasons why I really recommend trees because especially considering climate change and just your energy bills, you know, probably most homes should have at least a shade tree close by. Now, depending on the size of your yard, you have to be careful that you make sure that you get a tree that isn't huge. So in the picture on the right, that is the McBain Oak. That is a giant burr oak. Don't plant a burr oak in your tiny little yard. So the one way you could get your tree cut down is if you plant something that's way, gonna get way, way, way too big. But there are smaller oak species like um, post oak and blackjack oak, very drought tolerant. So if you were in, for example, Southern Missouri where it was really rocky and dry, those would be great trees to plant in your yard. But it's really hard to buy them uh, from a nursery. Like if you go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot, you go wherever you're going to go, even just a like an actual mom and pop nursery, it's rare for you to get those. So you can actually start with an acorn and grow the thing. And then like I said, even if you move, you may come back and find out, look how huge that tree is later in life. Trees are one of the great things, and plants in general, is that they get better as you get older. The older you get, the more awesome they get. So it's really, really cool for that. So other things I can say, you're just one person. I'm okay, you fine, you convinced me, I'm one person. Get connected. So this is kind of true of everything. 
You know, our society, we just have so much where we just want to be, I'm going to do my thing and I'm not going to hang out with anybody else. Connect with some people. You can join, if you're in the Missouri, join the Missouri Native Plant Society. There's a Facebook group. It's got like 10,000 people in it and they will help you out. There are local chapters pretty much in every part of Missouri. Most states are going to have some kind of Native Plant Society. Here in Missouri, we also have the Missouri Prairie Foundation. So they have a lot of cool stuff. And like I said, if you want to learn more about this, go see Doug Tallamy's books, his talks. He's got way more details on this than I have time to go over. Very, very good idea to look at. So you might even be more specific. Where do I get the native plants? Uh, the best thing to do is to be as local as you can be. Uh, there are some big na native nurseries. Um, Prairie Moon is kind of a famous one. Um, it's pretty good, but you know, knowing where their seeds come from, it's like you don't really always know exactly where they're coming from. And because they're kind of up in Minnesota, they could come from all over the eastern and even western U.S. And like I said, it's still better to do that than to do nothing. But the best thing to do would be to find um, kind of a local native plant seller. What we have here in Missouri is the Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. If you've never been there, it's super great. You can also just buy for them online. So if you're in a kind of a distant part of Missouri, they will ship to you. It's not super cheap shipping, but you can do that. You can also, if you want to get woody plants like trees and shrubs, like I was talking about, you can go to the state nursery. The problem with that is they tend to sell out really fast and they sell them in bundles of 10. So if you want one, that becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, the other thing you can look for are native plant sales in the spring. Uh, most of the major population centers will have quite a few of these. Sometimes you'll see some of these at farmers markets as well. And the cheapest thing that you can do, especially if you're a young person and you've just got time on your hands, go collect some seeds. This is actually the time of year you can do this. You want to be really careful about identifying something as native. You can use iNaturalist. It's not super great about winter stuff, um, but it should be able to work pretty well. So one thing you can do is you can just sow it out of doors, like find a spot and like throw it on the ground. And usually if you leave it alone two or three years later, something will come up. You can also stick it in the refrigerator and do something called stratification. You leave it until probably about March or April. Uh, you sow it in pots outside and you can grow your own plants that way. And they grow themselves basically. It's not, it's not that hard. It's not that difficult. So these are the things you can look for. So you can, this is something you can do. You can contribute. There's lots of bad things in nature going on. You hear about, oh, climate change, this, pollution. This is something you can do that can actually make a difference. These insects have very small home ranges and just little bits of plants can really boost their population. It doesn't take that much. And this is one of the things where collective action, you know, if we can get a bunch of neighbors all together doing this, we can make a real difference. So it is something that is gonna be helpful. And they use less water, so it's gonna help us with uh, water resources. Of course, they're gonna be absorbing carbon dioxide. That helps you with climate. It's great. Just do it. It's kind of one of these great things. Now, I was going to do this when I did this in person. I had some seeds uh, to give away. Um, I do actually have some of these. Uh, someone we you, you all would have to contact me. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel called Biophile. So if you go to my channel or you're seeing this on my channel, um, I'll have some contact information where I'll have some of these seeds. You can actually grow trees from seeds. I know that's crazy, but it's a thing you could do. So I've got a few butternuts left. I've got some post oaks. I'm stratifying these. I've got just a ton of persimmon seeds. It does produce edible fruit, but um, the trees are male and female and only the female produces fruit. But if you don't have any persimmons in your area, you do need both. But it's the cheapest possible way you can get seeds is doing that. So I can talk about the second ones. Uh, native pecan. Missouri is in the native range. You can find pecans if you're just paying attention, just walking around in a lot of cases. Um, northern pecans are the ones that are going to regularly produce nuts. So you have to be careful when you go to the store. Sometimes they'll give you things that are from farther south and they won't work. 
I've already mentioned blackjack oak. This is another smaller oak tree. And one of my favorite uh, perennials is New England aster. So this one blooms during monarch, my, monarch butterfly migration. So if you want to support monarch butterflies, having some flowers in bloom when they're migrating is really, really important. So anyway, I hope I've convinced you. If you're interested in this sort of thing, I will probably be having a few more videos about this, maybe do some seed collecting in the winter time so you can kind of recognize what you're looking for as far as native plants. Um, but that will be on my channel hopefully soon. So thank you all for paying attention and I'll hopefully see some of you later. Bye.